don't fall for an ambush. Colonel, my daddy always said, when you want to insert a nail into a piece of wood, you don't do anything fancy or glamorous. Just take the damn hammer and hit the son of a bitch till it's in. What exactly does that crap mean in English, Captain? Withdraw your men. Load them up with heavy artillery. Then when night falls, they go back in and they pound that place with mortars, rockets, and cannons. Everything we got from a safe distance. It ain't fancy, but it will sure take care of your hostile military force. All right, do it. Withdraw the men. Hello, listening people. Hello. Hi, Bartek. How are you? I'm doing very well, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing very Polish. That's how I'm doing. Are you doing very spitting? Yes, yes. I mean, it is cold outside, and but I, I don't have a reference for spitting. How is the Polish culture going these days, Bartek? How are we up? The, how are we doing in the world? How's Poland doing? Google it. Okay, Google. Tell me what Poland's up to. <laughs> oh my God! They've done what now? So we are spin Polish likingly because we are always spitting, and I guess we're both Polish. I feel like the more I learn about my family, the more Polish it becomes. Yeah, it's like it's like the Polish is the DNA, but the spit it's easier to get DNA from. <laughs> if that makes sense, it you. does make sense. Yeah, let's make super soldiers out of it. So Bartek, we are doing our show in which we talk about movies, pictures, power. Well, unlike our other show, a televisual event in which we talk about TV shows that we haven't done in a while. But we are not alone for this. People who can read the title may see feet someone, not like feet as in the things attached to my leg, but like featuring. Mm -hmm. Who are we featuring for this one, Bart? Like, who's joining us for this merry ride into the powwow of pictures? Who's here for PP? Yeah, I, I was going to make a cute reference to the fact that the listening people are with us, but since you set it up in such a way that my joke won't work, because it's a joke, everyone, you're not really with us, um, I will answer your question directly. This episode is featuring our friends from The Contrarians Podcast, Alex and Julio. Hello, fellas. Hello. Howdy. How are you both? Doing great. Yet another step in our spit and polish journey. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. So Julio is being tell us, uh, oh. far more. I was going to say, Julio is being far more uh, cordial than I am. I'm hot and miserable right now, not due to the scorching temperatures in Texas, but due to the uh, content of the film that we're here to cover today. Yeah, eugenics gets me pretty hot too. So and bothered. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell us who you guys are, which ones which, and tell us a bit about your show. What the contrarians do for those who haven't listened to the iconic episodes that we've done with you in the past and that single episode we've joined on your show of. <laughs> tell us all about you. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll defer to Alex for the pitch. <laughs> All right. Well, we are the contrarians. Our battle cries: "We are right, and you are wrong." Uh, I, I am Alex, and Julio is the one with the uh, sexy Peruvian accent. And what we do on the contrarians is rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine. We like to find a movie on Rotten Tomatoes that is highly rated. Uh, now that has become in vogue to be a certified fresh film. Uh, fuckers use that for their marketing campaigns these days. We find a movie that is highly rated, certified fresh, and bring it down to size, find maybe some of the aspects of it that were um, sweeped under the rug or kind of covered up in lieu of the building it up and kind of bring some of the negatives to light. And then, of course, conversely, we find the uh, lowly movies, the rotten movies, usually 30% and below, and make a case for their, their positive merit and why they're movies you should uh, aim to seek out. And Julio... That comprises our first portion of the podcast, but we always bring it home with how we really feel about it. Yeah, that's uh, the real talk part of our show, so where you where you find out how we really feel. Which, you know, when you come, what we guest on, on your show is if your listeners have listened to one of the other appearances we've had, that, that's all real talk. We're not going to pretend. Uh, we're we're going to be completely honest about our feelings this time around, uh, yeah. uh, uh, as usual. I'm yeah, glad but... to hear that because. Let's get into it. Pictures, powwow, or as we call it, PP, the original PP. And um, <laughs> Bartek, what was the film that I recommended for this episode? What was the film that apparently has one of the contrarians red hot? <laughs> the film was and still is 1998's Soldier. Starring Kurt Russell, Sean Pertwee, Jason Isaacs, Gary 
fucking Busey is in this movie, Bartek. Gary Busey of Predator 2 fame. Gary fucking <laughs> Busey. Uh, so if people at home have not seen Soldier, the general plot of the movie is... Julio, how would you describe the plot of this movie? What, what would you give as the brief synopsis of it? Well, I think the the pitch, the elevator pitch when they went to the studio was like, imagine Kurt Russell in an action movie, but take away all his charisma. Okay. Go. But what's the plot? <laughs> he's, a, he's a he's a soldier. That's a, you know, as, as the title says, he's a he's a titular soldier, and uh, he he's great at his job until a new generation of genetically engineered soldiers uh, basically put him out to pasture. He is a uh, He's. They think that he's dead, so they dump him in a planet, but mm. he's still alive, and he recovers, and he he be- becomes part of the community that lives in that planet. Yeah. So, and but thank shenanigans you. Shenanigans ensue, and shenanigans and and family ensue. Mm-hmm. So, Bartek, what is your relationship and history with this movie, if you have any? Relationship with this what? Movie. We we cover movies, Bartek. Bartek, movies. Look over here. Here. I'm dangling some keys. Movies. Movies. Have you seen this movie before? It's moving images. Have you seen it? No, that's a key. Oh, that's a key. But what about Soldier? Have you heard or seen this movie before? No, I haven't. So you knew nothing other than my pitch last week, which was Kurt Russell is a soldier dumped on a trash planet? That was my pitch. <laughs> yeah. The only bit I really remembered was Kurt Russell and that it was somehow related to Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. And when I looked it up, like, two days ago, just to, like, remind myself of what it was, I saw that it was, you know, very uh, negatively reviewed. So that that was basically everything I knew walking in. Fair enough. What about you, Julio? Have you seen or heard of this movie before having to watch it for this? Uh, like, the title sounds familiar, but I, in the back of my mind, I was getting it confused with that uh, Gary Sinise movie. Uh, I think it's called Imposter. Okay. Which I know I've seen it, but I don't remember much about it. But it's kind of like a, you know, an action movie with Gary mm. Sinise kind of like on the run. Titles uh, and occupation. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I, I was I, I looked up the, the IMDb page just kind of like to see what I was getting into because you mentioned something about the director, and uh, mm. I get the Blade Runner connection because I saw it was written by David Peoples, who's who's a great writer at least, yeah. you know, from what I, from what I know, and. Uh, and you know, I I told you over over Twitter, like I don't have a problem with Paul W. S. Anderson, yeah. Uh, so so I was like, all right, I I went in kind of like knowing very little and not knowing what to expect. Fair enough. What about you, Alex? I know that you kind of know a little bit more about the this kind of era, like your your actiony stuff, and it's got Kurt Russell of Tango and Cash fame. But had you seen this movie or heard of it before? Uh, I feel like I had heard of it, but never seen it. Uh, Kurt Russell has a very fascinating filmography. And yeah, I was very, a very high praise of uh, Tango and Cash when we did that recently. Specifically his performance, I should say, not the the overall movie. But um, Paul W.S. Anderson, God bless him, married to actress Mila Jovovich now and went on to make enough money to put his kids through college and his grandkids through college with the Resident Evil franchise. Uh, seemed like he was uh, he had high ambitions here early on. Uh, so much so, he yeah, like Julio said, he thought, let's take Kurt Russell and I'm going to put him in my movie and he's not going to say anything. Uh, he's going to have about 10 words of dialogue in this entire film and it's mm. going to work, goddammit. So I had seen this movie before, it seems. I'm the only one with a major relationship with it. So this is old news for Bartek and for some listeners out there, but my mother is a huge, huge Kurt Russell fan. (laughs) So my mother loves Kurt, and so I've seen a lot of Kurt's work over the years. You're on first name basis. I'm uh, I'm Mr. Kurt Russell's biggest... (laughs) I'm I'm Kurt Russell's biggest fan, apparently. So I grew up with this movie. I remember my parents getting it on VHS and then on DVD. Uh, my father likes science fiction, another reason why we watch this movie. My dad likes anything science fiction. He'll give it a go. Even if he doesn't like it, he'll give it a go. Mm-hmm. Soldier, we gave it a go. My mum loves Kurt Russell, gave it a go. Watched this movie many times over the years. I've always enjoyed it. It's not in my like top 50 science fiction movies or anything like that. But 
I enjoyed the premise of the movie of like this highly trained soldier guy getting disposed of and having to survive in, on a trash planet in like a hippy dippy community. Very like an old western reminds me of uh, Shane, the movie Shane, which in turn then became the movie Logan. So, <laughs> you know, I I appreciate that aspect. I have no relationship really with Paul W S Anderson. I have seen his movies, some of them, but I I, I haven't seen the truly god awful, terrible ones enough, like at all. Like I have never seen a Resident Evil movie in my life. They've just never have been on when I've been around. Like, no one I know is ever like, let's watch one. So I haven't seen that part of his career. I saw Event Horizon at a young age, left an impression on me. Seen it later years. I like it. It's not perfect, but it definitely has ambitions. Soldier, never have seen Soldier, never seen Mortal Kombat. I have seen Alien vs. Predator one time. And I don't remember anything about it, which says a lot. Same. <laughs> we did the uh, Three Musketeers movie on our show, and we both agreed that for what it was, it was a surprisingly fun movie. Like, for what it was of trying to make the Three Musketeers a blockbuster franchise, which is a tall order, it was surprisingly decent and fun and had good performances, as well as some funnily bad ones. And that's my relationship with Paul W. S. Anderson. I, I don't hate the man. He's made two or maybe three movies I have liked or at least enjoyed and I'm aware of his terrible legacy like he's this stigma on the on the film industry that people talk about <laughs> but I haven't experienced that stigma so I can't hold something like Soldier or Event Horizon to some evil degree of disdain because of what he's gone on to be because I haven't experienced that I understand people who do but I can't so yeah I've I've seen Soldier a fair amount of times I recommended it for this show because it seems like a movie that we would get a conversation out of. But uh, I was listening to the Contrarians episode on Tango and Cash, which we also did an episode on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized, Bartek, you and uh, the Contrarians know Kurt Russell, but don't seem to have the greatest familiarity with like his work that much. Seems yeah, like, like the general kind of like... We've seen his stuff, but like not enough. Could always see more of his stuff. The most I know about it, Kurt Russell is that he has a certain fan in New South Wales. Yeah. My mum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I would recommend a Kurt Russell movie that's a little bit off the beaten path. Something that isn't Escape from New York or any of his John Carpenter stuff or Hateful Eight or any of his cowboy stuff. Like I, 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 I know all heartbroken that I didn't recommend Sky High. I was I about didn't. to say that. <laughs> But I thought, I, I'm going to recommend one where Kurt Russell is going out of his way to really do something different. My mum says this about the movie. It's the movie that did the biggest crime in cinema. They cut his hair. <laughs> <laughs> they cut my boy's hair. That's how my mum describes it. She's like the godfather. <laughs> my boy. <laughs> Look what they've done to my boy. And it's just like the locks of his hair. She's holding <laughs> the locks of his hair. And you're in the background like, what is this? I'm in the background picking up stuff, yeah. <laughs> I'm picking up the rest of his hair, try to put it back on. So that's my history and relationship with it. Bartek, what did you think of Soldier? You walked in not knowing too much about it. We've seen it. It's a very simple premise movie, but mm -hmm. what did you think of it? How did you think it landed? I thought it was not bad. I thought it was a decent experience. Yeah, go yeah. on. Tell us how you how it was for you watching it. Um, we were kind of talking about this a bit before we got the call from the Contrarians this morning. Um, it did a lot of it. It had like familiar beats. Like it's mm. it's a movie where you set up the main character to be like this great guy. He falls and falls into a community that is completely different from what he knows. Yeah, and it's the experiences that ensue from that. And with that kind of premise in mind, it's somewhat familiar. You have ideas about, like, what kind of things are going to happen mm. to the point that, like, okay, these are, the, like, the cliche ideas. Um, you, you were pointing out, like, oh, they're, they're going to be an uprising. They're going to become, you know, powerful people. Yeah, he's still... going to train the pacifists how to use weapons. There's going to be that boring episode of The Mandalorian, right, where they go to the hippy-dippy <laughs> planet and teach them how to defend themselves against a bunch of trained military figures. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, going it's to be like, like... It's like... They're going to learn his ways and he's going to adapt their ways to some extent. Like, that kind of story. And then when the film didn't quite fall into a lot of those, like, cliche trappings, 
it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, like we were talking about, like, I love how the movie even acknowledges, right, you're going to train us, right? We're going to use the guns and defend ourselves. And he's just, the movie basically uses him to say, fuck no, we've not, we're not going to do that. That's boring and lame. The movie's about me being a badass. I'm going to be a badass for the next hour, okay? Fuck that shit. <laughs> because you're right, that is like a tie. And there's some things that the movie does that is familiar, cliche cliche tropey but it does avoid some of them in ways that you just go oh okay because when i was watching it last night i completely forgot that he didn't do that with the hippies i was expecting <laughs> them to be like okay teach me how to use a gun and then they didn't and i was like oh part of me part of me <laughs> was waiting throughout the film for like okay so how is he going to transform and it's in very like almost unnoticeable ways very yeah. small little ways i mean yeah. obviously the most noticeable is when he cries for the first yeah, time he, was about he cries and he, he picks cries. up a child <laughs> yeah he cries and picks up a child um so you did not know too much about it how did you feel about the, like the 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 overall like more so of the experience like how it played out did you have an issue with how the film was kind of more wordless because i know over the many mm. episodes we've done you do like a little bit more dialogue. This one's surprisingly sparse with it. Some people may have issues with that, and we'll talk about it. But what did you think of that? No, I thought it was fine for this one. The fact that Kurt Russell only speaks 104 words, <laughs> according to the trivia, is yeah, just fine with me. Um, especially like early on, we have like that first 10 minute sequence where it's all just like the training day stuff, mm. and there are you know there is dialogue there, like a woman like giving like. Yeah, oh, background be, be, dialogue. be emotionless virtues but that whole sequence i felt really said a lot without saying anything literally yeah you know this is the kind of environment they grew up in this is how they are becoming emotional emotionless soldiers i even joked before we started like oh they're doing the guest pose where he's sitting on the bed yeah, yeah, um, yeah emotionless yeah. and the fact that Kurt Russell would not speak up unless spoken to throughout the film. I felt that it was all believable considering what we were set up for. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree. What did you think of Kurt Russell and what's your relationship with, with Kurt? What's your understanding of who this actor is? Every actor like this mm. has their persona or identity that we, the audience, take away and understand them to be. And we kind of talked in Tango and Cash that... He like that persona wasn't as familiar to you in mm. Tango and Cash, but what do you know of him? What do you what do you feel about him? Yeah, my understanding of him is that he's like the good looking action guy, and I know that you obviously you bring him up a lot because of your mum, but you also always bring up how the Metal Gear Solid franchise is just like oh, it's all based on that one character he did in a movie. Yeah, Escape from New York. <laughs> Escape from New York. <laughs> so you think of him as like the handsome, quippy action guy? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. What about you, Julio? What's your feelings about Kurt Russell as like an actor? What What do you think of him as? Well, see, I, I I kind of started. I hadn't really thought about it until we did the Tango and Cash episode, and then watching mm. the the movie, watching Soldier yesterday, I I thought about it a little more uh, because I thought maybe I'm wrong, right? What I said back in our our Tango and Cash episode was that unlike Sylvester Stallone, like I mm. didn't think that that Kurt Russell had a movie or a character, a movie that defined him. Like even if, you know, if, if anybody said something like, uh, well, he played Snake Plissken or, or he, he played uh, McReady in, in, in the thing, right? I'm like, when you think of those movies, you don't say that's a Kurt Russell movie that you think, or at least I think, and I think most people do, they go, that's a John Carpenter movie. Yeah, same, you know, with, and, the, and, uh, same with Big Trouble in Little China. Exactly, exactly. Like, you know, and so, so to me, Kurt Russell's always felt like a like a good actor like a solid actor a charismatic actor reliable mm. actor you see Russell and you know that he's gonna put in the work he's gonna give a good performance mm. but not quite he, he's never reached that iconic level uh in a movie i think that on his own i guess an actor yeah he, he's he's an a-lister but he's not mm. like even something like tombstone i think mm. you know that's more of an ensemble it's not that Kurt Russell vehicle so to me Kurt Russell is just it's always been a solid actor, charismatic actor, but not somebody defined by a movie the way that, again, you know, Stallone is defined, if nothing else, by Rocky or Rambo or both, yeah. right? And so uh, that, in a way, I think makes him more uh, approachable, relatable. Like, you know, I think it's easier to... Versatile, He, he doesn't too. come... Yeah, he, he doesn't come with a baggage, you know, when you, when, you, when you see him in a performance other than, 
you know, Kurt Russell, but he doesn't come with other roles attached to him. Uh, mm. And that was the thing, like watching Soldier last night, I was like, this is a weird use of Kurt Russell <laughs> because mm. that, that was, the, I mean, I have, I overall, like I enjoyed the movie, mm. uh, it, but it felt that, as much as I like Kurt Russell, and I think he does fine with what they give him, it was kind of a, a a waste of Kurt Russell. Like to put Kurt Russell in your movie to play the emotionless soldier, it's kind of a misallocation of resources, right? Like it, because we know that he can do much more. I'm not saying that it's not difficult; it doesn't require you know the talent to play the character that he does here. But it's knowing what I've seen Kurt Russell do in other movies that I've seen, you know, it just mm. felt like why would you do that? You know, if you have Kurt Russell in your movie, why would you give him the the role that doesn't really play to his strengths? And yeah, I, I get what you were saying that, oh, he's doing something different. And maybe mm. that was the whole point, right? The attraction is that you get to see Kurt Russell be very un Kurt Russell. But but yeah. to me, the sacrifice that the movie makes in, in order to do that, you know, it, it's like that the trade off is not it's not worth it. Because I'd yeah. rather have Caruso play like the leader of the of the hippies, in uh, I or... I think Kurt Russell what makes him different to a lot of his eighties macho men counterpart is he's a team player, so it never feels like his ego ever exists in a project. While fucking Stallone, that's a part of what people love is just his <laughs> fucking ego, and it's like. Yeah, we think of them as John Carpenter movies. We think of them as like an ensemble thing because Kurt Russell is playing it as a professional. He's he's not making it the Kurt Russell show. Well, when we watch Tango and Cash, it's so fucking clear how much Stallone's ego was dictating that project. It's like, I want to be this. I want my lighting this way, this way, this way. And Kurt's just like, there to be like, I'm here to be here too, guys. And that's kind <laughs> of like what makes him approachable and 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 fluid as a performer is. You're right. It's never feeling like, oh, I'm just watching a Kurt Russell movie. It feels like you're watching a movie with Kurt Russell in it. His 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 vanity as an actor is is almost non-existent. Even though he's a pretty boy who likes to show off how handsome he is and whatever in stuff like Overboard. In Overboard, he still knows that Goldie Horn has to be the attention of the movie as well, and his dumbass friend and 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 all these other characters. <laughs> Um, what about, uh, what about you, Alex? What's your feelings on, uh, on Kurt Russell? I know that you got a big boner for him over the recent years for Bone Tomahawk, but what do you <laughs> think of him and what did you think of Soldier? Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth there. I was going to lead off with my rousing praise for Bone Tomahawk and how, like, it was like, to me, the culmination of kind of his journey as an actor for him to have that performance in that movie. But, um, the thunder has been taken from that real quick. I need to make sure I point out, I, I resent the notion that the entire Metal Gear franchise is based just off of, uh, Snake Plissken, but well, that's a, that's a different discussion for a different day. Uh, no, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Snake is based off of Snake Plissken. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> We'll we'll circle back to that in another point in time. Uh, it, it's it's uh, fitting that you pose this question. Uh, I actually watched this movie out by our pool with my dad right, right before we recorded, and part of our discussion was about Kurt Russell as an actor, and uh, obviously my dad being older than me, having lived through uh, the entirety of his career, talking about how you know he started as a child actor. Mm-hmm. Um, his first movie, as Hulu and I kind of discovered together on our uh, Tango and Cash episode, was he was just like an extra kid in some Elvis film, and then uh, his big, I guess, coming out might have been the... By by most uh, standards, his big coming out was when he played Elvis on that made-for-television movie that came out in the late 70s. Um, uh, I, I mean, a lot of what you guys have Directed said... Directed by John Carpenter. Yeah, they were joined at the hip. And um, a, a lot of what y'all have said so far, uh, I definitely agree with in terms of it seems like he should feel like a bigger deal than he is in a lot of the shit he's in. And I mean that in the best way possible of like, he has the great looks as discussed by y'all. And also just I reverting back to my memories of Tango and cash, just how just shockingly good looking he is and has just like that classic movie star look about him and uh, his ability as a comedic and dramatic actor. He has it all across the board. Um, So it's kind of funny that, 
a lot of times, not his movies, but he as an entity kind of slips through the cracks. And I think this movie might be hmm. an, an allegory for that in general. It's like the the idea that uh, the idea of the Terminator originally with Arnold Schwarzenegger that sometimes you don't really need to say much for your performance to do it uh, to make an impact and really leave something behind. And I think up until this point in his career, Kurt Russell had already done so much great work, and I can understand why he at this point in his career thought, well, maybe I do need to do something where. Uh, I am just more of a presence than an actual performer. So that, that, that's kind of what makes the crossroads he was at in his career at this point in this movie kind of fascinating to me. And what did you think of Soldier? <laughs> well, Ryan, uh, Soldier was okay. Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed uh, Michael Chiklis. I thought I got a, a great novelty out of seeing him pop up. With and hair. Um, it really, you know, if I'm just going to go ahead and be honest here, if we're, we're we're going straight to real talk here, this really felt like one of those movies made for Brian Bosworth or, you know, uh, a football player in America that hadn't had fallen on hard times and needed to made, make some action movie. It really felt like some B-list actor dropped out at the last minute and then they're just like somehow lucked into Kurt Russell and they're like, OK. And the film studio said, here's 50 million more dollars. Here you go. <laughs> OK, so. I love Soldier. I'm just going to say it. It's my second favorite Blade Runner film. <laughs> I think it's better than Blade Runner. I fucking hate Blade Runner, but we'll get that's a conversation oh God, for Ryan, another day. Come on. Um, uh, I'm so sorry. I love Kurt Russell's performance in this. And I think one of the interesting things that we as a culture think of too is Kurt Russell plays. Like, iconically, we think for some reason Kurt Russell plays fast-talking, quippy, charismatic characters, but two of his most famous characters are silent, stoic types that, in the universe, no one likes. No one likes Snake Plissken in the Escape movies. They all hate him, and he barely talks in them. <laughs> Same with MacReady in The Thing. He barely talks in that. When he does, it's straight into the point. He's very stoic, very isolated, very out there. And, like, those are two of his big roles. Jack Burton, on the other hand, is, like, him being John Wayne and going, like, full ham, right? And a lot of his career is silent, stoic types, weirdly. Well, you still have other things, because he's diverse. You still have things like Captain Ron, in which he's laughable and fun. But even in Bone Tomahawk, he talks, but only when he needs to. And he only says the things that he needs to get across. And a lot of the great stuff in Bone Tomahawk from him is just his face. And I think it's the same here with uh, with Soldier. I think a lot of the great stuff from Kurt Russell is all in those eyes. It's all happening in his eyes. And I do appreciate seeing Kurt Russell like strip back and just have minimal dialogue. And I don't need the film to be heavy on dialogue. I was actually very happy with how much the film was just doing visual storytelling, and it was coherently visual as well, which is something people don't associate with the director anymore. You watch the director's newer films, and it's like incomprehensible to understand what the geography of things are, the choreography, any of that. But I love Kurt Russell in this movie. I think he does just great little micro-expressions, and it reminds you why this is a film. Films... You know, the camera's right up on their face. You're reading everything that's happening in their face and their body. This is different to stage. We have to be bigger. Kurt Russell is a film star. And he shows it here. He does all the he does the action stuff. He does the the stoicism. And when he cries, you believe it. Because you know, he's just so built into this into this role. I think Kurt Russell is a, an interesting choice for the role, but I don't think he's a wrong choice for it either. I think that it could have been easy to star some bigger, bulkier action star guy like a Stallone that they wanted originally. But the thing that someone like Stallone and uh, Schwarzenegger don't have in comparison to Kurt Russell is the supreme acting ability. They are movie stars. They're, they're charismatic. They capture your eye. But the, the amount of acting required for this role from those guys, I don't think you would have would have got it as, as strongly as you do from Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell knows the right amount of things to do. He does the head tilt at the right moment. He does the growling. He does all of this stuff. And we take for granted as viewers how 
fucking difficult it is to actually pull off doing a silent role. I mean, Clint, Clint Eastwood makes it look easy. Kurt Russell, I think he makes it look easy, but when you think about it, it's really hard to the point in which we don't see a lot of these roles happening in modern cinema as much as you would like, especially in big mainstream ones where they're throwing millions and millions of dollars at it. You see it from smaller filmmakers. I enjoy this movie. I also enjoy not just Kurt Russell. I enjoy Jason Isaacs quite a bit. I enjoy... um. What's the name of the actor who plays the other super the super soldier, Jason Scott Lee? I enjoy him a lot in this movie too. He doesn't have much dialogue either, but he's intimidating as fuck. Like that scene at the beginning. I was about to agree with you, and now I'm, I'm taking it. Back. No, you don't like Jason Scott Lee in this. <laughs> he's okay. I he's, love. He's okay. I love, but, but you know, I wouldn't put him on the same level of enjoyment that I got from Jason Isaac. No, but he's lower down, right? Like he's the brute force uh, of the movie, but he does a great job of being that. Like I love the scene at the beginning where Kurt Russell's doing the running, and they let him do twenty minutes later, and you just see, you just hear him before anything. You just hear those massive boots just stomping on the ground, mm. and just he's this fucking mammoth of a man just runs past Kurt, Kurt Russell, doesn't even acknowledge him, just keeps running. I love that kind of shit. Bartek, what did you think about um, some of the other performers? We're talking a lot about <laughs> Kurt Russell, and I think it's because Kurt Russell is doing something different. He's cut his hair. He's bulky as like he's super fucking ripped. Like Kurt Russell's <laughs> always been fit, but he's been like a a jacked. He's always usually like a beefy guy, not like in the same way Stallone is, but like he's got you know like some fat on his bones. But like he's a big guy. But in this is like no fat on that body at all. He's just pure muscle. Mm-hmm. What did you think of? Of the other characters and performers, anyone else kind of draw your attention or your eye other than just the, our main player, Kurt? Well, with with the the rival character, the other super soldier, um, mm. I felt like th- at the beginning of the film he was utilized a bit better than later on in the film when You're we right. got to the climax. Because again, that beginning part of the film set up the well, the, the, the whole idea of a super soldier really well. You know, what they are, mm. what they went through. This is the best one. Hey, here's someone better. Mm-hmm. And it was this, you know, great scene of, you know, him surpassing him in every way, him surpassing him even when outnumbered. And it, and even after that stellar performance, the fact that he, like, had his eye scratched was a huge problem that, like, didn't give him any praise. So mm. it's, like, you know, this intense thing of, like, there is high quality at stake here, and even when it's, like, 99%, it's not good enough. Yeah. So uh, he was intimidating there, and, you know, I was always waiting for him to come back. And then when he does come back, he spends most of it inside, like, a, a tank, like a vehicle. Yeah. And it's, like, we really didn't need him to be... But you did, because the film set up that he's useless now, he's got no death perception, yeah. chuck him in this role. Like, he's not going to be out there doing the action stuff because yeah. Kurt Russell crippled him. Yeah, it makes And that se- means he's weak. I know, it made sense why they put him in there, but that's that's for them. For me, the viewer, I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> this guy could still do some damage. And he does. He comes he, out and yeah. he's like, hello, it's and me. When he eventually... Yeah, but and that, that's, that's after a fake-out death thing, though. Yeah, yeah, At yeah. that point, it's like, well, no, I know you're going to do more, so, you know, get get up, let's do it. Yeah. And then we had one final action scene. Yeah, that was good. That was back to kind of what I more wanted. But mm-hmm. the whole time where he's in the tank, it's like, you know, this isn't really what I was promised. I did like that his weakness became what Gary Busey was saying, which is like, yeah, they're 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 good, like all these stats, but like, what about their psyche as soldiers? Because these guys have experience; they're mentally, my guys are mentally with it. But uh, the super soldier guy, um, Kane. He gets cocky after having defeated Kurt Russell, and that's kind of like his downfall. Like, he plays it super cocky after that point. Like, at the beginning, he's just a blank slate. But that one victory makes him have a character trait, which is he's arrogant. And as a soldier, you can't be that in the battlefield. You have to be precise. And that's what Kurt Russell takes advantage of. And also as an antagonistic force in a movie, yeah. Well, yeah, but that's what Kurt Russell takes advantage (laughs) of, right? He's like, well, look at that, you can kill me with that, I could kill you, ah, fuck you, I got you. I I love that when he slashes him with a helicopter blade, because (laughs) again, I miss the idea that Paul W.S. Anderson as a visual filmmaker, one of the things I really like is is the geography. 
every set piece and everything that he uses to kill people in these set pieces, like the helicopter blade or the propeller blades of the plane that they're living in, it's all set up in the movie, but it's not like done in that way a lot where it's just like, here's a shot telling you that's going to be used later. It's just like... Yeah, I didn't get that at all. No, and I think that's something I do miss in action movies a bit. Like, I love those John Wick movies, but they are a little bit too showy of, like, that's going to be used to kill that person in a moment. And I'm like, oh, okay. I know they're <laughs> going to use that book. But <laughs> wouldn't I do prefer if he, his final, like, failure, or, you know, the, the, the way that Kurt Russell ultimately defeats him is because he doesn't have a depth of perception. Like, you know, he reaches for... <laughs> for his gun and, the, and you know he misses because he, he's actually missing an eye like mm. i honestly thought that that's what they were setting up you know once mm. he comes out i was like that's right he heard him earlier and that's gonna help him uh you know in the but final they, show but they paid Instead, off breaking his neck like he was trying to do at the beginning on the chains at least yeah that's true yeah yeah he didn't get to um, bite him this time <laughs> like a fucking pussy. that was uh I, because you just brought it up and i, I don't want to forget like i i think that that was really my main struggle with the movie was that I couldn't really tell where it stood, like what it was trying to say. And it may be clearer if I rewatch it because now I know how the story plays out. Mm. But I, as far as the, the, not just the journey of the Kurt Russell character is that Bartek was talking about how, like he was trying to figure out how he was going to change. And I was kind of too, like I was, it, I couldn't tell if this was going to be a movie about uh, Kurt Russell reconnecting or actually discovering his humanity mm. after having been programmed to be a killing machine right and so was this movie about the kind of like the ptsd that happens after you are no longer a soldier yeah it, and that was fascinating like i thought that was great right they they created this killing machine and then they got rid of it and now he has to live with that threw it away and, like trash and, right so, so to me that was fascinating but then the movie becomes an action movie in the last part, you know, the last, I don't know, 30 minutes or whatever. Mm. And seems to, instead being about, it becomes about him embracing what he used to be, which seemed like a, to me, it felt like a, like a complete 180 from mm. where the movie was going, you know? And then in him triumphing over, you know, the bad guys is about him just being a badass soldier. And so now the movie becomes about praising the fact that he was, I guess, you know, a classically trained soldier as opposed to a genetically modified soldier but mm. it, it kind of removes the the humanity part of it you know i always thought that the way that he was going to win was i, I didn't know how they were going to do it but i'm like okay so he's going to prevail either by uh, uh you know doing something that that he wouldn't have done before as, as a mm. soldier that was trained to kill or by fully embracing his humanity by sacrificing himself and you know saving the community but end up Logan being style, neither yeah. of those things <laughs> right instead it's just him you know being a badass and it, so that was really weird because it became it, you know it's like it's like two different movies that come together in the middle you know like the action right. movie and the more soulful exploration and to me you know like the the performance that Kurt Russell is is giving fits more it's it's a lot easier to appreciate in that first half you know, I, I agree that you know when he cries i'm like we're we're getting somewhere you know there's like a breakthrough <laughs> but then you know it's just it's something else then it's just kind of like him playing the a more typical action character right you know that so I, I don't know how you guys feel about that what about you alex how do you feel about that what was your general journey with it all uh so one thing i wanted to call out before I pretty much before I forget, uh, Ryan, I know you're a Malcolm the Middle fan. Did you notice? Um... Yes, the kid from Malcolm the Middle. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, Dabney, I think, was his name on Malcolm immediately. The Middle. Immediately, I was like, "That's the kid from Malcolm the Middle." <laughs> yes, perfect. <laughs> all right, so we, we tackled that. We established that already. Um, so it's a great action movie. Like that's something that. Uh, a blessing and a curse being part of a, a podcasting community and also where uh, something you do one day of every week is watch a movie through the most critical of combs and sift it through you know every rock tumbler possible to find every you know what does this mean what does this mean uh, what can I take away from this one of the downsides of that is watching something like this and just trying to make too much of it it's just what I love in a great 90s movie is just mindless destruction and action. In the first five minutes of this movie, there was at least 100 gunshots, and mm. that is what I live for. That 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 is absolutely fantastic. So, you know, some of the things I've said so far about uh, 
the plot is predictable, that's fine. You need movies that move along as predictably as possible, even down to him hugging the kid at the end. It's it's the way movies are meant to play out. My main thing was going into this with the lack of knowledge that I had was I was just disappointed Kurt Russell wasn't more quippy and Kurt Russell-y. And that, that's on me for not doing more research and understanding what I was watching. Um, but like you said, his facial expressions, his physical, his body language, the physical shape he was in was just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so it's mm. a good time. It's flimsy, but it's meant to be. Uh, one of the things, I before I forget, I need to give praise to it damn fine cgi for 1998 uh i you know by today's standards it's okay yeah. but for a movie that's fucking almost 23 years old i was very impressed with how good some of the cgi was um all these you know I, i'm in agreement with julio about some of these things that i would have wanted more from it but it still falls within that realm it's an hour and a half it's in it, by no means is it a waste of time definitely ryan to your point of kind of growing up with it so to speak if this was a movie from my childhood that i watched a lot especially god knows i have uh any movie i watched on vhs at any point in my life i have a nostalgia for so i can definitely relate to that and um it's it, it served its purpose for today, just sitting by the pool, drinking a few beers, staring at the TV, watching a bunch of destruction happen. So it uh, it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. Like we're here to analyze and stuff. But the thing too, and I, I look, I understand where Julio's coming from. I get that, but I think one, it is a space. It's a western in space. It's a Shane in space where you need him as an audience to do the full soldier thing because the movie pitches that to you. Like he's this super badass who's good at killing and being a motherfucker. And I could imagine if he, if they didn't do that and they went with the star Trek route where he's all peace and love at the end and flowers and he talks them down. <laughs> Alex would be fuming right now. He'd be like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> I wanted him to stab a guy in the eye, which they do. I think it's that thing of this is an action movie. But it's not fully, like, it, it's trying to be a few things at the same time. But I think it's that thing of, like, like in Logan, like in Shane, the pitch is, this is an aged fighter. This is a gunslinger. This is a mutant. This is a super soldier man, like a highly trained soldier. Yeah. We need to demonstrate that ability. And he's not going to demonstrate it against the villagers and he does only when he's having ptsd flashbacks but that's not the same as seeing a skilled tactician take down the people who took him down in the first place it's that basic carnal need of the audience wanting that but i don't think it fully goes against his his arc either i think it's a thing of you have to embrace what you are while still being able to change See, he embraces the fact that he's a soldier, that he was that. I mean, he got kicked out of the village because he was a soldier still. Like, he was teaching the kid how to defend himself. But still, by the end, he still embraces his humanity. He becomes a father figure to this kid. He becomes friends with his fellow soldiers. He's not just their soldier buddy anymore. Like, they're all friendly. He gets rid of the bad guys, and they travel off to the planet, and they're just going to live there. You don't need to see that. You just know that's going to happen. But you need him to do the thing that's the name of the movie. Like, at the same time, like, <laughs> like if you watch, imagine if you watch John Wick and they did the whole fucking thing and they killed his dog and then his recourse is not to just murder them, but his recourse is to just calmly tell them you let me down. <laughs> You'd be fucking annoyed. Yeah, but see, the, that's the difference. Like, the, John Wick is about him going back to that life. Right. It's not that it, this movie is not about or, or even unforgiven. You know, there's not like it, one of those movies where, oh, Kurt Russell had left the soldier in behind and they dragged him back in. This is like, like, I don't think it, I, I, threw I, I get that. He, right. But he, he, I mean, he does have an arc or, or you know, like the big change. In, in I hadn't really thought about it until you just pointed out that he seems definitely to connect with his other soldiers, his fellow soldiers in a more human way. You know, like that's I can see that. But to me, it, the biggest change in the movie happens to the villagers. Like to me, they're the ones that go through an arc. Like they they have this creature and they distrust them. Then they embrace him. Then they reject him. <laughs> he becomes uh, uh, dangerous or violent. Mm. And then they welcome him again when they realize that oh well, it's actually useful to us. Yeah. Right. And so 
it's a, that kind of leads to my my other point, which is that I I wonder if the movie wouldn't have been better for me. Because obviously, I'm in the minority here. But if, if Kurt Russell, the character of the soldier, hadn't been the one that led the story, you know, if if the story, if he wasn't the story, but if you were telling the story centering on him, but instead on on uh, my favorite character in the movie, who's uh, Connie Nielsen's husband, who then gets Sean Pertwee, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who's the son of the third Doctor and Doctor Who, John Pertwee. Yeah, yeah. Wow. i got to get my sci-fi <laughs> credit. And he's my favorite killer in the TV show Luther. Just want to mention that too, Sean. And he's Alfred in Gotham. Just want to point that out too. Yeah, what else is he? Um, English. <laughs> he's, uh, <laughs> he's killed unceremoniously in this movie. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand, like, you want that shift. But I think it's it's that thing of... Where, you... but the film is also cynical. Like the villagers only like him because he is useful to them as a tool. But the only people who see him as a genuine person is Sean Pertwee, is the wife, and most importantly, the character that has the biggest arc because of Kurt Russell and Kurt Russell because of him is the child. They change one another because they're similar to one another, but they're different at the same time. They're both people who can't, they don't, don't talk. They're both, like, that's the thing, like, the child is so important to this movie. Also, bonus point for the movie to instantly make the child not talk. That's always a bonus. Whenever you have a child actor, it's always a bonus that you don't let, 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 let them talk. Unless it's Jake Lloyd, give him dialogue. <laughs> give him more, give him more. <laughs> but I, I think, like, that's, that's the thing. The villagers never embraced Kurt Russell, not really. They always were at a distance. The closest were the family. Michael Chiklis wanted to embrace him, and then he got attacked. The rest of Mm -hmm. them were always distrustful of him, and then they found the excuses to kick him out. The thing is, the the, the family, they are the ones that defended him until they themselves encountered the issues of his PTSD. They misinterpret the incident with the snake, thinking that he's being this cold bastard soldier man, they didn't realize that he was teaching the kid to defend himself. See, well, the rest of the village, they never actually embraced him. They never actually tried to accommodate him at all. For these people who are all about peace and love and being friendly and adapting to the harsh environment, they never tried to help him adapt. The only people were the, the main family. They helped him by giving him accommodation and food and trying to be friendly. But like when the PTSD stuff happens, none of them know how to deal with it. So what's their solution? The same as the military. Throw him away. Just throw him out. Just kick him out of the, out of the village and he'll fend for himself. Hence he cries. He doesn't understand what he did wrong. Because to him... He was doing the right thing. Hence, he breaks just like a child. He doesn't even recognize what tears are. See, that's the emotional stuff that I love about the movie because it is a bit cynical. It is saying like, hey, these people don't care about these soldiers. Hence, the Jason Isaacs portion of the story is far more overarched, but it's the same thing. Nobody cares about these soldiers. They're just disposable people until they can serve you. What do you think about that, Bart? It's like you're 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 literally yeah. stroking your chin, going, "Hmm, thoughts." <laughs> no, yeah, I've been thinking this whole time um, because I'm kind of in a different spot about um, wh- what I think of everyone, despite the fact that I was talking about earlier how you know this film didn't do some cliches, and I like that. There were some things that I think the film did do that kind mm. of lean into a more idealistic thing that I mm. kind of you know gravitate towards. I do think that the that the community grew fond of him mm-hmm. but it, it's just this like you know practicality and realism of like look if we keep him around things might get a bit worse because we don't truly understand who he is i felt like when they were what know, he's capable of what he's capable of i feel like when they were exiling him they did have i did get a sense of fondness from them about him yeah they felt bad about it they but... felt they felt bad about it and i do think that they grew a bit fond of him but just because they didn't know how to deal with him they were prioritizing you know their their lives over his like i think even yeah. some of them were saying like look we're exiling you. You can come back and get, like, supplies and stuff. We will help you out in that way. And I thought that was, you know, as sad as it was that they were exiling him and, you know, as he cried about it. Yeah. I did feel like, yeah, there is some warmness here. And mm. and we were talking earlier before in, in Julio's point about how um, 
you know, he still was super soldier throughout the film and in the climax. But I think the big thing there is like, why is he fighting now? Because earlier it was just like orders, 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 military. I'm just following my directive. That's what soldiers do. That's what soldiers do. At that point, though, when the fight began, yeah, you can argue that there was like the revenge thing going on, but he wasn't receiving any orders. He he genuinely was fighting. He he tried to save the father guy. Yeah, um, yeah. And I also love, even when he defeats Kane, when he snaps his neck, this is again down to Kurt Russell's physicality. He treats it like, like this is a sad thing. Like mm. he lowers the body... With this kind of sense of like, this is just like this isn't this isn't great. Yeah, like like he lowers it kind of like like this is the most precious thing in the world. Even though this is a guy, the reason he's been dumped on this trash planet, like he's evolved as a as a person yeah. by this point. Yeah, and the slowness of that scene too actually gave me some time to remember. Like, oh yeah, he had him in this like grip earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also yeah. love um. They they avoid certain things like again I think the villagers are relatable and I understand them and that's the thing I like is like I, when they throw him out I'm not going oh these fucking pricks they're just doing this because this happens in the plot I understood their rationale I don't know how I would deal with Kurt Russell in my village right but it's still in the thesis of the <laughs> film is nobody's giving him any support yeah it's sad on both ends for and me, they yeah. even mention this like Gary Busey mentions like about about, about the support is these old soldiers. They would not just storm in, they would wait for backup and support. Like, again, it's these things that tie through in what is just a Paul W.S. Anderson shoot 'em up action movie, right? I like that there's some depth here. I like that there's something to think about. Hence, you, you can when you watch this, you can see why this is a cult classic movie, right? It didn't do well at the box office, but it has an audience. And it's not just because Kurt Russell stabs a guy in the eye there's 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 substance underneath the sheen of it all which is what people also like about event horizon mm -hmm. right there's substance there underneath the sheen of it all but the rest of paul ws anderson's work i don't know if people genuinely think there's lots of substance to mortal kombat <laughs> <laughs> different kind of substance yeah video game adaptation substance mm -hmm. but yeah i i also really like the Sean Pertwee, the wife, and uh, Kurt Russell. In another movie, Sean Pertwee would have kicked him out of the village because he's like, you're horning in on my wife. <laughs> Were you uh, waiting yeah, for yeah. that? Were you waiting for that? I wasn't necessarily waiting for it, but when I mentioned earlier, like, the cliche ideas in my head, that was one of them of like, okay, Kurt Russell's having a lot of scenes with this wife, so what's going to happen? I, th I think I even said something very similar in an episode not too long ago, but I can't remember. What oh, Drive, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and they don't do, like, even at the end, it's more about his relationship with the child than it is with the woman. Mm. Like, that's who Kurt cares about the most is the child. He relates to the child child is him basically he, he's yeah as he's humanizing himself but not for romance yeah yeah that's something neat like like he becomes a human not because of a girl mm. isn't that kind of fun yeah in well, one of these movies but, but i would say that the movie does go out of its way to show that he is attracted to her I mean, they it, it doesn't. I was happy that they ended up not hooking up because that was my yeah. first thought when they when they killed uh, the husband. I thought that that was just basically them creating an opening for Kurt Russell to to hook up with her without having to feel guilty about it because you know oh well he died. Uh, so I was like glad driving. that they didn't go that way. But yeah, but I not, think that... it's not like Hancock where the movie's just like, look, it's Jason Bateman. He's the nicest guy, but Will Smith's going to fucking steal his wife because <laughs> fuck Jason Bateman, right? Like, go fuck yourself, Hancock. What a f I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Julio. Go on, go on. I, I agree. That movie sucks. Uh, but no, it, here, I think that there is still, like, there is part of his change is because of her. I, I think that oh, a lot definitely. of what drives him is is that he has that connection with her. I don't know if he was not, if he didn't have an attraction towards her, if he hadn't felt that connection with her, I don't know that he would have gone back for the villagers at the end. So, oh, so in a way, it's, it's still driving. It's, it, but it's the kid, because even the dad says, oh no, they're going to kill Nathan. And that's what he reacts to. But is he reacting that because because it's the kid or because it's the son of the woman that he finds attractive? Uh, I think she served a purpose in him opening up to others in general. Because wasn't there the whole thing of, like, he told her that he feels fear and discipline. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was reading, like, oh, he is, like, hanging out with her and doing things with her 
because he feels like he has to be obeying orders in some way. And yeah. and in and in hanging out with her, so I keep saying hanging out like this is a chill film. In in spending time with her so much, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a Richard Linklater film. They're just hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. In him chilling with her so much, um, you know, he starts to realize like, okay, that there isn't like a a deep purpose behind all of this. This is just like living. I also think because the film doesn't explicitly follow it up with him kissing her or anything like that, getting at the end, I think too, like when he cuts himself and he still keeps chopping the carrots and she Mm -hmm. reacts to that, I think also like he trembles when he's touched by her because also you get the feeling like he's never interacted with women before. And if he has, they're like supremely military women who are like, you don't even need to salute anymore. Mm. Remember that? Yeah. So I also think it's not necessarily like he's 100% attracted to her, which of course it's this, it's a movie that's the predisposition we're going to go towards. But since the movie doesn't actually go all the way there, mm. I think it's also just, this is a woman who's nice to me and has physically touched me. And yeah. like, I've never experienced, like it's, he's, it's someone he's who's never even yeah. cried. Yeah. It's someone who's nice to me. And also they're not the same as me. Yeah. yeah I, I will say one of my favorite gags, because the movie does have humor, but not too much, which is also something I like about it in comparison to event horizon. Event horizon has some of the weirdest misplaced humor ever where like like, this sassy black guy who's just like i'm here motherfucker i don't don't get me started about that but (laughs) i love there's this visual gag of she's teaching him how to plant the um the vegetables or whatever and the and and that and he does it but it's just his hands you see he puts it down and he just smashes the dirt like he's just so brute (laughs) force he's less gentle about it he just that was a nice little visual thing. I, I like those little little touches throughout the movie uh, as well. What do you think about this, Alex? What do you think about this whole debate we're having with Julio about whether it's the child or the woman? What do you think? Uh, I found them just inconsequential to the story, or even, I guess, consequential. It's uh, Of course... And especially in the 90s, you got to have the kid that drives some part of the narrative that, like, this person's wanting to win over the kid's trust or wants to prove the kid right or this kid gives them a new lease on life or, uh, you know, insert the Sixth Sense plot here. It's, you know, the, the, the kid always has some big happening in the 90s movies. So that wasn't surprising. It definitely had some Waterworld vibes to it here. Of course, that... Uh, uh, Kurt Russell's not speaking, but comes across this family, fortunately, or unfortunately. Nor does him, he have gills. They're... Just want to point that <laughs> out, too. <laughs> I was going to say, unfortunately, the dad is still in the picture. So he has to kind of like, uh, you know, kind of worm his way around that. Um, the the one thing y'all didn't call out about that, that I thought, I don't know if it was meant to be funny, but I laughed at was he was attempting to teach this little kid how to kill a snake with a, a boot and yeah uh, yeah so that's kind of one of the things he gets banished from the the land for and then the snake crawls into the bed with the parents and then the little boy grabs it and they wake up and this little boy is just using the heel of this boot to smash the snake to death and it's kind of almost like melancholic the parents like oh we did wrong but just the visual of this little boy swinging this boot maliciously made me (laughs) laugh for whatever reason I guess from a from a formulaic point of view, the fact that this action somehow came to a, made a huge revelation that forwarded the plot was kind of funny. I think if I had to talk about my main issue with Soldier, it's too short. I think it needs ten more minutes. I think you need five more minutes of when he's been exiled because it's literally he gets exiled and then he's back again. Like it's you, you're out of the village. Cry. <laughs> Kid does the boot. Dad comes back and says, Hey, come back, please. It's very short. Yeah. And the other five minutes I would like to allocate to time is I would just like five more minutes of him just hanging out in the village and knowing more about mm. the dynamic of the villages and, and stuff like that, because it also feels really quick when the soldiers come and ruin the status quo of things. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like, I don't need this to be two hours. I think just a few more minutes here and there to stuff like that. And here's one scene that, um, I don't know why I hate doing this, but it reminded me of, uh, the last Jedi, you know, in the last Jedi, when Luke Skywalker gets told that, uh, Han Solo's dead and we never get to see his reaction to it. Cause that's yeah. a cut scene. Yeah. Um, 
There's a moment where Gary Busey dies, and Gary Busey's like the one person <laughs> that uh, that Kurt Russell respects, and we never get the moment in which he finds out that Jason I like he got killed. Yeah. We just see he dies, and that's it. We just move on. I w- I've always thought that ever since I was a kid, I've always thought. I would have loved to have seen the old soldiers walk in and they see that they killed Gary Busey. Hence another reason they're throwing them outside. Because he was like the only nice person to these soldiers. But and was he? I mean... He was. He was. He was I mean, a he, military I think he was, guy, but he he treated them like um, better than Jason Isaacs. Right. But I mean, he was he nicer He saw their than value. Isaacs. <laughs> but, but he was still... Because at first I thought, yeah, maybe like through the first half of the movie i'm like man this, this it's so weird that they put uh, gary Busey as the voice of reason in the movie it was like this that is was deliberate too mind. by the way i mean i i i believe it, it he, that was great uh and actually i liked him through the entire movie but but then there was a moment i don't remember what is it is it like uh it's like either an order that he gives or just his reaction to something that Jason Isaacs is doing. And I'm like, okay, so he only, I mean, he only cares up to a point. And then after that, he's like, oh, fuck it. I'm going to go play cards. No, and no. So... He, I, I know what you're talking about. It's when he just tells Jason Isaacs the easiest way to do this is yes, just to roll yes, back yes, and yes. bombard them. But mm-hmm. he doesn't know that, but he's not saying kill our own fucking men. That's what Jason Isaacs is saying. Jason Isaacs is like, leave them out there fuck him what he's saying is there's these insurgents that we know nothing about who have killed a bunch of our dudes the easiest thing to do is not to keep sacrificing our dudes in vain go roll back and use military tactics he's like he's the military guy in the room of military people who's demanding that we do this the most simple and obvious way and jason isaacs is there to shine himself off and prove that his super soldiers are Ed 209 and that they're worth it. It's a brains over brawn thing. Yeah, it's brains over brawn. And I can I just say, I love the comedy duo of Gary Busey and Jason Isaacs because <laughs> I laughed every fucking time they interacted because Gary Busey's just being like a real southern boy who's just like, my daddy used to say this. I was and, and Jason literally I literally going to say the exact same Even, even words. though Jason Isaacs is being American, you could feel his Britishness coming out in his anger. Like, oh, this fucking American twat. Why is he talking? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Every time it come back to them, I, I was always on board. I was like, oh, man, I kind of wish that we got to see their adventures because they fucking... Because like, Gary Busey, he's not even like Gary Busey reacts like he hates this guy. He's just like trying to react to him like, no, 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 think about this from the logical perspective. And, and Jason Isaacs is like, fuck that. I just want to do it my explosive dumb way. <laughs> um, what did you think, Alex, of seeing Gary Busey as the logical, calm voice of reason? And what did you think of that side of the story with Jason Isaacs and him? I was curious if the conversation was going to circle back around to this, because I think that's one of the more fascinating points of this movie is that Gary Busey is the most tame individual in it, or at least one of the most tame individuals, especially (laughs) in the, uh, you know, two decades that have uh, unraveled since this movie was released. He, I think unhinged would be the word that a lot of people would use to describe him by modern standards, or at least what people know of him. So seeing him hair slicked back, clean shaven, and just, you know, the most Hollywood, you know, wardrobe you could see of a costume for a movie with the, you know, the double breasted blazer tucked in and he's got the insignia on the one side of it or whatever. I, I got such a kick just visually seeing him the first time. I audibly like laughed just seeing him. So I, I think that's something that you can, uh, that that's obviously me seeing it for the first time in the year 2021, but that's a compliment I can give it. Is it uh, made a, a character I find uh, in incredibly over the top to be very tame? But uh, to the point that you were asking, his side story is you know fascinating in the sense of from the program they ca- they came from. He seems to be the one with I guess the most human touch, but uh, that's obviously it's a it's a a program that isn't necessarily designed for the human touch, but I think you guys know what I'm saying. He, he felt that, uh, well, just like you were saying him and Kurt Russell's dynamic was one that unfortunately didn't really pay off. And then Isaac's almost feels like he's in a different movie. Uh, but I mean that in like a good way, it seems like he just kind of 
read the, the script and he's like he's like okay yeah exactly he twirled the end of his mustache a little bit and got some maple syrup on it and was just like all right this is a, this is how i'm gonna do it and if they like it then we can keep it in the movie if not find someone else <laughs> i love jason isaacs because he could only play two roles british evil and american evil that's all he can do <laughs> that's all he can do is just what kind of prick can i be and when i think of him See, people of, like, our age grew up with him in the Harry Potter movies, right? That's, like, what we knew him for, Bartek, right? Oh, yeah, Growing I guess up. so. I knew him from Soldier, and every time he came in Harry Potter, I would just, I would say, and my mum would be like, Ryan. But in that way where she's like, you're right, I would say, oh, it's that piss ant. Because that's how you would describe him in this movie. He's, he literally pisses himself. Yeah. But he's a piss ant of a person. And every time I see Jason Isaacs, I think, what a little turd. What a what a piss ant, this fucking guy. Yeah, a weasel turd. Yeah, yeah, I love Jason Isaacs, but he can only play evil and evil, but with different accents. That's like all I ever see him do. And yet I love it. Like, I kind of don't want him to stop doing this. So when I do see him in Soldier, it's like, oh, this is old hat for him. Was he in the tuxedo? He was, and he was the charming James Bond type, and it was weird, because, like, oh, he's going to be evil, right? No. So, like, I love him in this movie. I love the mustache, because it's that little touch of showing what a pompous prick he is. Like, immediately when you see... You don't even need him... He's not a tough guy. You don't need him to talk to know that you won't like him. (laughs) Right, Vardzeg? I see what you're saying, yeah. Like, he doesn't even need to utter a word to know that this guy's going to be a fucking prick. And I love that kind of stuff in movies, because it only really exists in movies. (laughs) But you know what I'm talking about? I love... What did you think, Bartek, of Gary Busey dying? Did you see it coming? Uh, in the way it happened, no, not really. Right, because he was the the other man was such a pissant. But I guess the fact that he you know shot him to death while the guy was just going to tell him something was yeah. <laughs> I love that Gary Busey before he died, he was just so casual, like ah, oh, let me just tell you this. I just <laughs> he got was, shot. He was about to like b- like laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was <laughs> just like this fucking guy. Let me tell you. And I'm, then he got g- some... I'm gonna give him something. Watch this. Watch this. And, oh. <laughs> I like, too, that it's set up as well, without being obvious, that Jason Isaacs was always carrying that pistol right there. Like, I was noticing throughout the movie, because I, I remember how Gary Busey dies, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, yeah, he's always carrying that around. Like, it's always, like, right there. So it was like, okay. it's obvious stuff. It's obvious filmmaking stuff. It's not anything too high to praise. But I was noticing this time around, all these things around in the movie that were used were actually there. Like, oh, that was there. That was in the movie. That was in the movie. Like, sometimes, especially in action movies, like Tango and Cash, they just pull out their fucking ass, and you just go, where did this come from? Fuck me. Um, His shoe. Yeah, his shoe. Yes, his shoe gun. Don't fucking start on the (laughs) shoe gun from Tango and Cash. Um, Julio, you're a Jason Isaacs fan. You loved him in Star Trek Discovery. Did you love how he had the same accent in this movie? Evil. American. I mean, I I didn't honestly. I didn't notice that, that that it was the same accent as in Discovery, because the characters are different enough. Like, I yeah, mean, they're corrupt they're both... military figures who have no regard for anyone around them. Completely different. Yeah. Well, yeah, but but not to not to alienate uh, Alex in well enough part of Discovery, but but you know his character in 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 Discovery is, you know, like his character in Soldier is all talk. You know, I don't. Mm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think that his character in Discovery would like piss himself. You know, his character in Discovery <laughs> is more like, yeah, let's go forward and let's just. So, so I think that I never saw like much of a similarity over like the superficial stuff. Uh, but I like the performance. I I like Jason Isaac too. I mean, it, it's uh, it's funny because to me, I didn't grow up with Harry Potter, and even though I had seen Harry Potter, you know, before I saw. Uh, his one season TV show that he had here in 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 the states. Uh, that's what I think of when I think of Jason Isaacs. That was like the first time that I am like, oh, this is that actor from that show, uh, Awake. And uh, he's not a bad guy there. He's a, he's a cop that lives two different lives. Like he keeps, you know, switching between two alternate realities. And uh, it was it was like a cool show. And he was just playing kind of like a a straight character, you know, just being the the cop the and, protagonist and, and so that's what i did think that of. again he's just like i'm <laughs> yeah, never <I> <laughs> doing that again what i mean though is like i love with actors having studied acting i love that there's just certain things and we've seen it with other actors they go right 
what's the check marks of what I can do to emphasize his character? So in Star Trek Discovery and in this, he's like, I'm playing a corrupt military figure. What do I do? Southern accent. Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Fuck it. And then you can just do it from there because he's a competent actor. But like, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, like, especially in movies. I like how you... Southern is... O- the Southern accent is always used to already give a character to what it is like just them using that specific accent even though in discovery he's supposed to be trump he doesn't use the trump accent he uses a nice greasy hello there <laughs> i like how for both gary Busey and jason isaacs you've described them in some ways related to the south <laughs> well gary Busey, <laughs> well, yeah, because aren't they <laughs> Aren't they? <laughs> Gary Busey's constantly like, let me tell you about my daddy. Yeah, but that's meant to be like a sort of like humbling factor. <laughs> yeah, but they're it? two spectrums. But that's what I'm saying. Like, you use a southern accent. There's so many things in movies that you already have a built-in understanding of what that means for the character. Like, Gary Busey is saying he has a dad and he's using that accent. You already build into your head what this character is without Gary Busey having to do anything else. Yeah. Should, should we turn to our friends here and say, what do you think, people from Texas? Yeah, what do you think, y'all? <laughs> <laughs> you gonna tell me what? Technically, we're further south in the world. Yeah, we're further south than you, so we're the real southerners here. <laughs> yeah, I, I live in Texas, but I don't know that I qualify as Texan. So, it, and I don't do you know have a hat? Do you no, have a, I don't. You don't have a cowboy hat? You don't have a Stetson? I can't I can't wear them. It doesn't doesn't go with the shape of my head. <laughs> We're talking about this. This is an action movie. You're a patron of Whataburger. You qualify. There you go. Well, well then there you go. Then as as a patron of Whataburger, I can say that I I mean I get it. Like the 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 you know, the associations that you that come with a southern accent and the, the way that they're saying things. It's uh, you know, like let me tell you about my daddy or my dad always say like to me at least it's like, oh, well, this, you know, he's like a good old boy. He's like a country boy. He has like exactly. a certain set of values and that stuff. Honestly, I, I don't think that that comes, at least for me, it's not so much about having lived in Texas for, I don't know, 15 years now, but uh, but more to do with how movies have taught me <laughs> that that's what it's like. Yeah, that's what like, I'm saying. Like movies use certain accents to give you certain character traits that don't even have to be in the script. Like Gary Busey doesn't have to tell us anything about his character, but if he says, my daddy taught me with that accent, you build in what his character is. You don't have to do anything else. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> Alex says, uh, yep, like, my daddy and I watch this by the pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the late 90s, like movies in general, but like the whole thing throughout the 70s, 80s and 90s where there uh, is any mu- movie based in the future where one character is just the token Southern person. That always just makes me that, that gets a huge pop out of me. Just the idea that, you know. It, the year is 2084 or, you know, 20, uh, 2099. And there's still someone that's just like, well, we're going to be on it like Moss on a Mississippi tree stump. There's always going to be one Southern character in it that just <laughs> the one, has the to one, have all these lines and euphemisms in the, it. The one I don't get is um, outside of Farscape, Australians and sci fi media, Australian characters, not even actors, yeah. they usually play perverts racist or creeps i don't know why like in babylon 5 there's literally one australian actor in the whole show and he plays a supremacist i'm like what's going on with us in sci-fi i don't know what's what's our deal i guess we just if they can't get british they get us to do bastards that's it um it's an action movie. Bartek, did you have a favorite moment of action? Did you have a moment where, you know, when you watch these action movies, you get that bloodlust, right? You get that thing where you you go, mm, yes, yes, fuck that. And we didn't get that with Tango and Cash that much outside of the first Kurt Russell action scene. Did you have any moments of enjoyment of action, anything in particular? Yes, but it wasn't like a bloodlust kind of thing. Okay, yours was like different than arousal. Okay. Yes, yes. I got a very huge um, thingy when we got the scene where Kurt Russell tricked the super soldiers with the with the dummy. Yeah, with with the dead body of their friend and just yeah. started shooting. <laughs> I love that so many of them died to an object that was just shooting in one direction. <laughs> they could have just walked around and they still died, but they don't have combat experience. See, that's the difference. Mm. What about you, Julio? Um, and what's your relationship with action movies? Are you a big fan of them overall? And did you get any kind of in, like particular moments of enjoyment from the action here? I like them. I just I might have seen too many of them to where uh, it, 
I, there's some stuff that I'm just kind of desensitized about. And uh, it, so this kind of circles back to the, it, like, it, it's well-made action. But during that last, like, climatic battle, the last 20, 30 minutes of the movie, like, that's, I, I wasn't really, I didn't have much of a connection. But, you know, I was like, oh, this is just Kurt Russell being, you know, an action star. So I wasn't, so to me, I think that my my biggest emotional moment Action wise was when uh, they were him and and the dad were running away, you know, and and mm. then eventually the dad gets blown up and loses the leg. And to me, that was like the action sequence that action uh, that I was worried about, you know, yeah. what's going to happen. And then of course the worst thing that I was fearing happened, which is like they got rid of the fav- uh, my favorite character in the movie. Oh, not uh, not that Michael Chiklis's homemade scarf was now ruined because he used <laughs> it to try and tie up the bloody leg. <laughs> No, he, the least, his least favorite thing was the fact that now the romance path is open. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. the romance side quest. Doesn't he um, ask when he's uh, when the when the dad's dying? Doesn't he ask him why? Doesn't he ask Carissa why? Yeah, like why are they doing this? Uh, just, yeah, like, that was it's orders. Heartbreaking. It's orders. That's that might be the, the the moment in the movie that I that really hit me the most, like where I connected the most. Yeah, yeah. In that action stuff, I actually like what hit me the most is that sense of like when the ship comes down and just that look on Kurt Russell's face of knowing, oh, I know exactly what this is. I'm from that thing. I feel really bad because I had an inappropriate laugh at that moment because I misheard uh, one of his lines, the oh, other guy's lines. Sean Pertwee. Yeah, when he saw the ship, I thought he said, "Oh, lemon party." <laughs> no, that's a different. Movie. <laughs> um, Alex, you said you enjoyed the you Alex, you said you enjoyed the the violence and the action action in this and i kind of get the vibe from you you're more of a horror guy than an action guy but the two genres always do overlap with one another what particular moments of action did you get a thrill out of with this uh yeah i'm definitely a horror guy i wouldn't say one over the other i just i like to subscribe to uh really cliches uh, big cliches sometimes in films and uh, horror and action seem to carry those as much as any other genre so and also i'm I'm a dude so just the idea of bloodlust as you said is very appealing honestly the the thing i reacted to most in this movie besides just seeing gary Busey, um was when shit was going down and they had just the shot of kurt russell walking around the corner into focus with all the flames up behind him and he had like the minigun on him and he's all sweaty and you know the, the camo on his face i that's one of those things that i just see and I go hell yeah because it's it's why we're here we're here to just be entertained <laughs> by what's going on so that's like the shot that i remember most vividly but um and then, of course, the one where he lured him in to the trap where he had the, the dead guard that he was pulling the strings on and then set that bomb off. That was that was probably my favorite part during the climax. I mean, you got to love the, so what are you going to do? Click, click, gun. I'm going to kill them all, sir. And he's like, <laughs> zoom in. Like, fuck yeah. Another moment I love of the action is what's his... Uh, like, yeah, once he's, like, defeated Kane or whatever, he, like, stands up and an explosion of fire comes from behind him in the distance. Just, like, fuck yeah. My biggest <laughs> yes visceral reaction, and it's not even action necessarily, I just, it always makes me tighten my fist and go, yes, yes. Well, the slow kid is killed, right? No, is when oh. Kurt Russell grabs the, the radio thing and puts it to his throat and just growls at them. <laughs> <laughs> and then the hard cut to the guy being like, a gra- Jason Isaacs being so British, but American, a growl, a growl. I just love that. And then the follow through of him pretending to be one of them in the in the rover. And it's just like, uh, yeah, affirmative. <laughs> just keep saying that. And then it's like, you're going to ram into me. Affirmative. <laughs> just like <laughs> <laughs> That was a funny bit. I love that. It's cheesy, but it's just so fucking gratifying. And also... I'm a simple man. I've rarely, if ever, seen a chain fight like that at the beginning, where they're up on the chains, mm-hmm. and like the way that fuckers get killed on there. I'm like, this is great. I love that. <laughs> I, mm. I'm simple. I love that. Um, Bartek, you talked about your favorite, one of your favorite bits in the movie is that opening yep. montage. I love the opening of this movie. It's one of my favorite, like world building openings of a movie because this could be like Blade Runner where it's like here's a bunch of text for you to fucking read to get what this is all about but this movie's like no 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 we're just gonna see 
him grow from a baby to a full grown man and have barely any dialogue and you you know what's up. I think I really love and it's my favorite of that is the fat kid that's running slow <laughs> and the car pulls up <laughs> cut and you just see young Kurt Russell played by White Russell not react mm-hmm. to his friend getting shot in the face probably. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know that was why Russell. I I was like, man, casting department aced it here because they got a kid that looks just like a a young Kurt Russell. And then when the credits rolled at the end, I'm like, oh, there he is, U.S. agent. Miss, yeah, you 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 must be a big White Russell fan. He was in he was in that Captain America. He was evil Captain America, right? Recently, uh-huh. like. And people hate it. Oh, Bartek, people on social media were so fucking mean to White Russell because he played a character that's mean, and they're like, that means he's, that means that fucker, fuck him. I'm like, he's just an actor, you idiots. Aren't a lot of Marvel movie villains mean? Yeah, but like, he's, he, 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 he's the new Captain America when it should be the Falcon. So people are like, fuck him. Look at his <laughs> dumb face. I'm going to punch his face. I'm like, he's I, handsome. I, Go fuck yourself. I don't know what language you're speaking. I, uh, I'm speaking <laughs> internet vile. Um, anything else we want to say about this movie? Anything anyone wants to touch on? Um, I have a, a couple of things that are, are, are minor criticisms. and uh, But I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if any of you share them. Uh, one was that I didn't like the score. Uh, not throughout the entire movie, but there are a couple moments where I felt that it was it was a little too like heroic, kind of like generic heroic when like there were really bad things happening. I think it's like when the when the the village is being attacked before he comes back to to rescue them. They and I honestly I don't usually notice the score. Like it has to be really good or really distracting for me to like really catch on. You didn't love the love ballad that played during the montage of him looking at the villages, the one song that had lyrics. You didn't, <laughs> didn't love that? Like it. Nope, nope. But but that I could look past that. I'm like, okay, '90s, and it's just like it, it was a montage, whatever. But the the actual score that was weird because it just felt like they it felt out of place. I felt like that should have played either at a when Kurt Russell comes in later and it's you know, saving them or, or towards the end of the movie, maybe. I don't know, but it, it was weird. And then Just the other placement thing... placement of score rather than the actual music itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like it was unpleasant to listen to. It was just that it didn't seem to go with what I was looking at. Uh, but then the other thing that was throughout the entire movie is the weird slow-mo that he'll do like two or three seconds of slow-mo to like end the scene. Or, or I thought you've watched scene. a Paul W. S. Anderson movie before. He does that I... in all of them. I've never noticed it to this extent. Like, I think because it's not like he's doing it on action set pieces. He's doing it to punctuate like a big emotional Emotion. moment. Mm. Yeah, it, it, which was just weird. It, it it almost felt like I don't think this was the case, but to me, it felt like what do you do when when you're editing and you run out, you need to stretch out the shot, and so you slow it. In the, but I mean, there's no way that that was the case because it's, it happens throughout the entire movie. Would so this, it was. Would it be better if they shot the scenes in green for no reason? Like in <laughs> Triple One Killers. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about uh, Lemonade Joe. No, Lemonade Joe was yellow. Thank you. It's green sometimes. <laughs> it's green sometimes. Yeah, I don't. I agree. I think the weird slow mo thing is also like so like dates the movie. We'll talk about like the special effects. You think that would date it? No, it's those little tricks of filmmaking that really are like of the time like just certain things like remember how big in the 90s fisheye lenses were just like let's like matilda like let's just fucking have a fisheye lens no fisheye lenses here but yeah the weird <laughs> post process slow mo cuz it's weird cuz the movie has genuine slow motion in it too that is working because it's filmed with slow motion but that mm-hmm. stuff is like done in post and it and it feels so clunky and artificial i agree um, I do want to say with the music, I commend this about it. They know when to not play the music. The fight between Kane and Todd, no music, just pure sounds of meat hitting meat and metal hitting face. And I love that because I'm so used to m- movies and shows like Star Trek Discovery saying the music <laughs> is telling you that everything's happening right now. But I loved the the restraint in the action sometimes, not using music, just letting the silence of it speak volumes in itself. So I didn't have a problem with the score. Any other nitpicks from you, Julia? That was it. That was it. Uh, anything from you, Alex, that you want to bring up before we take this home? 
Uh, not particularly. I I will just say that this discussion we've had has made me enjoy the movie more than I did when I watched it. I was just like, this is, yeah, this is just like a 90s action movie. And then like talking about it and then, Ryan, your sentimental attachment to it. And then also because I just inherently have to enjoy things that Julio criticizes. So I've come away with a, <laughs> a better appreciation via this conversation. Fair enough. So that's it, listening people. That's Soldier a movie that exists in Paul W.S. Anderson's filmography. This is the last <laughs> movie he did as Paul Anderson. From here on out, he would be Paul W.S. Anderson. To not get confused with Paul Thomas Anderson. <laughs> did you know that, Bartek? <laughs> no. That's legitimately the reason. Like, all of his movies till till this one, this is the last one where he's Paul Anderson. Then he, um, also this film flopped so bad that he stopped making films. He couldn't get films made for quite some time until the Resident Evil stuff, which then reinvigorated his career. And what year was that? That was like a few years later. But like, Mm. here's what I mean of, he was so in the industry that he wanted to make this movie, Soldier. But Kurt Russell said, I need a year and a half to get ready for the fitness. So he said, okay, we'll delay this. And they delayed it for 18 months. So then he made event horizon in the interim of that, because that was something he had prepared. And then he came straight back to soldier. So he went from event horizon, like he wanted to make soldier, couldn't make it until Kurt Russell got fit, made event horizon, then went on to make soldier, both films, financial flops and critically reviled, but have great cult followings did mean that it affected Paul W.S. Anderson's career for quite some time. Even though those are passion project films for him, it cost him his career in a way. Hence, now is in it just for the money. The Resident Evil movies make money. He didn't do Resident Evil 2 because he was going to do Alien vs. Predator, the one that would make more money than Resident Evil 2 would. And now he's back at Resident Evil. Now he does Monster Hunter. And it's kind of like, isn't that sad? Like, I don't even care about the man, but isn't that kind of... No, he's making money, but like artistically, you like to think that people who are in the industry that make their like their artists, you like to think that they make their movies that are like, here's me trying to be an artist and they fail and it just makes them turn into cynical cash grab makers of films that put the bane of our existence with the Resident Evil movies. And it's kind of like a, a sad story. Um, did you know that Kurt Russell injured himself a lot on this movie? Did you read that, Bartek? Uh, very quickly I read it, yeah, because as soon as I finished it, I quickly looked at trivia, then I had to leave to come here. He broke his ankle, tripping over a ceramic vegetable. Um, <laughs> so he broke his left ankle, and then in the final fight scene with um, Kane, he, the, uh, the, 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 the like big letters behind him with the lights on him, one of them fell, and you can see it in the movie, it fell right onto his right foot. Like, mm-hmm. the back of it. Right. So they had to take a few days off for filming. Kurt Russell is such a pro- fucking professional that he still filmed this movie with two broken feet. Well, the trivia said Jesus. that he only did it for the paycheck, and that when he got his injuries, that paycheck still looked good. But you don't see that in the movie, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't feel like he's in this because, uh, I need money, or I just need to make a film. The fact that he put on so much, like, physical effort as to, like, physically transform himself does show that he had dedication to the role. Again, he's a fucking professional. That's why you <laughs> love him. That's why even in something like Sky High, he's great because he's taking it seriously, but not in the way that he doesn't understand the projects are goofy. Like, he knows Captain Ron's goofy, but he knows that it's a film that needs to be made and needs to take it seriously. This is an industry. Okay, but... But in this film, Jason Isaacs brings in super soldiers who are inherently better than the super soldiers that the main characters have. Yeah. And then, you know, they're a threat for a while. And then at the end, it turns out that the supposedly inferior one wins over the other because they're more skilled. Yeah. Hence why Kurt Russell's better than Stallone. I'm not not finished. (laughs) In Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets... Lucius Malfoy, played by Jason Isaacs, buys the Slytherin team Nimbus 2001s, <laughs> which are inherently better than the other team's broomsticks, yeah. but they still lose because the other team has more skill. Yep. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Jason Isaacs is the key to filmmaking. I'm just saying, I, I don't know if the Chamber of Secrets book came out first or not, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Bet <laughs> against saying. Isaacs. 
So that's it. Conspiracy. Alex, Alex is going to be recommending the film for next episode. It's Listening People's Choice. I realize that Alex has never recommended a movie to us. Julio's like, do War Machine. And then all these years <laughs> later, I say to Bart's like, did you know that, that Anthony Michael Hall was in War Machine? And Bart's like, response is, which one? War Machine? <laughs> so, I was thinking of War Story. <laughs> so, so, Alex, are you going to bring it home and recommend us uh, a film? What are you going to hit us with? I am. Y'all are going to stay in the year of 1998 as you are going to discuss a personal favorite of mine. It wouldn't be in my top ten movies or anything like that, but a movie I love and have received kind of cross, um, you know, kind of side-eyed looks for enjoying so much. And that is Peter Berg's Very Bad Things, starring uh, John Favreau, Cameron Diaz, and Christian Slater. And the most important thing I need you all to keep in mind when you watch this movie is that I believe Christian Slater could have received an Oscar nomination for this. I am not surprised he recommended this movie at all. (laughs) So that will be the one we talk about next episode. I do have a history with this movie, so that will be something fun to talk about. Bartek, I have mentioned this film to you as it is one of Roger Ebert's most despised movies he's ever watched (laughs) in his entire career. It sounds familiar. So, we'll be talking about uh, very bad things. I heard Cameron Diaz, so I'm looking forward uh, there's to There's another filmmaker, <laughs> maker, Peter Berg. He's a weird... Like, his filmography is like, all, all, over, all over the place, so we can talk <laughs> about that next. But I'm excited to talk about that. I, I should have known. I should have... I was like, is he going to recommend... <laughs> Like a, a slasher film, or is he going to recommend like a dark comedy thing? And I should have known. I was like worried that he was going to be like, guys, I want you to cover Jason Goes to Hell. I'm like, oh, <laughs> fuck. But well, no. To be completely honest very with you, Ryan, it, it, was, it was very bad things, or uh, the, I think it's 2002 or 03, Keeping the Faith, the romantic comedy with Jenna Elfman, Ben Stiller, and Ed Norton. It was down to those two, honestly. <laughs> but I just, I had to get some Daniel Stern in y'all's lives. So that's why I picked Very Bad Things. <laughs> put it on the list. Keep Put that one on the list, Keeping Up the Faith. I've never even heard of that one. <laughs> what? All right. So uh, I have heard of very, very Bad Things, at least. So that's it, listening people. A pleasure talking to you contrarians. It has been very, very fun. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? That's where you are located. I know you're in Texas, but the internet is a place too. <laughs> yeah, we're all over the internet. Uh, we have a, a website, wearethecontrarians.com, that has all our links. But basically, it, wherever they're listening to this show, you can probably find us as well. Just search for The Contrarians. You'll see the little podcast with the with the logo, the tomato looking at himself in the mirror. And that's us. We're about to have a, a serious... Well, by the time that this drops, Ryan, uh, we're probably a couple episodes away from starting a, a small arc of uh, M. Night Shyamalan movies. So uh, stay tuned for that. The greatest filmmaker of all time M. Night, the only man who could retroactively make his masterpieces worse so (laughs) and he made Lady in the Water and he made Paul Giamatti's Lady in the Water (laughs) so read the trivia for that one one, uh, what a wonderful time, we hope to have you guys on again at some point and please, contrarians if you do cover Oscar with Sylvester Stallone we're ready. Yeah, you're not allowed to do it without us. Yeah, we're ready. We're <laughs> ready that is, to talk. That Oscar. is officially, uh, yeah, that's that's officially the, your your next appearance, The Contrarians, is when we cover Oscar. Great. The great <laughs> film Oscar. What a starring Tim Curry. So that's it. You can find us on the social medias, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Spit and Polish Presents. We will post stuff on there. We're always interacting, all that kind of fun stuff you may even see me comment on things from the contrarians being like what the fuck man (laughs) julio stop dissing rick moranis on twitter you fucking hack (laughs) so um there's that we have our email spit and polished at gmail.com in which you can email us with your questions queries thoughts concerns and recommendations it's not just alex giving us movies, or Bartek or myself or Julio, you can give us movies too. We'll put it down in the list and add it there and go, 
maybe in a year we'll get to it. Yeah. But we'll get to it. We we recently got to a gnome named Norm, so anything's possible. Yeah, and we're about to put what was that film? The Faith Still the Faith thing? Yeah, the Faithy movie with Ben Stiller. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh that's it. Uh until next time, listening people, you've gotta remember that Kurt Russell is my mum's favourite actor. He's fit. My mum loves him. She will not watch Tango and Cash, though, because she says, although I love Kurt Russell, I will not watch any piece of shit he's in, just because I love him. <laughs> I'm not that blind, Ryan. I do have eyes. So that's what you got to remember. All of that information. Write that down. Fold it up into a piece of paper. Think about it really hard and let it go into the ocean. Oh, lemonade party. Oh, fuck, I mean lemon party. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of lemonade, Joe. We're always thinking of lemonade, Joe. <laughs> so, lemonade party. Oh, I should use that sometime. 